You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. <laughs> That's a first. That is a first. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had a dance party in the midst of an intro dance. That's a double dance party. I th- I don't know how to I don't I don't know. That's pretty awesome. I honestly didn't know I had a 3:30 alarm. That's uh maybe I did that in my sleep because I didn't think that was a thing. Anyways, now I'm a little bit off. I didn't even finish my thing. Packernet and Twitter and stuff. So, nailed it. Either way, check the description. Everything you need to know, it's in there. The phone number, NFL Big Board, Packernet, Facebook group, get it, got it good. Anywho, today a little tiny bit of coaching news. I want to brush through that as quickly as possible and then continue moving on with our little series here. This time looking at what is presumably um, one of the more difficult teams to play, but again... From year to year, you never know. Teams that were great could fall off a cliff. Teams that haven't been very good. I mean, I feel like that volatility is kind of growing every single year. So you never really know. But um, it'll be a little bit more interesting of a breakdown. We're talking about the Philadelphia Eagles. The Foles-less Philadelphia Eagles, presumably. So that'll be fun. So I already mentioned... uh, you know, again, if you want to call in, if you got a question or anything, uh, check the description. Everything you need to know will be in there. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to get off your chest, use that same phone number. You can text or call. It goes right to a voicemail. It's not going to be weird. I'm not going to scold you for calling in the middle of dinner time or anything like that. So go on ahead and get it off your chest, and we'll throw it up on the podcast. Maybe, probably, sort of. So the first bit of news, we talked about it a little bit a few days ago. Mr. Sean Menenga was in for an interview for special teams coach, and it was presumed that he was the front runner. He did end up getting hired. Um, I want to run through a little bit of his qualifications, but not too much. I don't want to spend a lot of time because I may have done that already. Cannot remember. I know I didn't cover it as in detail because some of this is news to me. Unless, you know, maybe I just forgot. I don't know. It could happen. You know, my brain. Sometimes, man. But uh, one little interesting tidbit, he came out of Vanderbilt University. For those that don't know, Vanderbilt University is in Tennessee, as are the Titans. So perhaps there was a little bit of a thing there where, you know, maybe they got to know each other a little bit. Or maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. I'm just saying. The Tennessee Titans Stadium and Vanderbilt University. You want to take a wild guess how far apart they are? Nine minutes. So, I mean, just saying, might be a lot of traffic or something, I don't know. But when Google Maps is telling me to take the back roads as opposed to taking the highway, you know it's pretty close. So, anyways, a little bit about the man. Um, Iowa native, wife, son, and daughter. One of each kind of situation. You know, life is kind of perfect for him. At least that's what they say, I don't know. I got three, seems cool to me. I you know, whatever. Apparently I messed up, I don't know. Um, As a coach, he started off doing a lot of defensive stuff. Southwest Baptist University in 94 as a graduate assistant, 95 and 96 as a secondary coach. Uh, 97, he's outside linebacker coach for Western Kentucky University. 98 to 2000, defensive coordinator for Hutchinson Community College. Uh, After that, from 2001 to 2004, he goes to Culver Stockton College. uh, First as defensive coordinator and then 2002 to 2004 as the head coach. Then 2005 to 2008 at um, Fort Hayes State University, defensive coordinator 2005 to 2008. 2009 and 10, he kind of went to a relatively big school, San Diego State University, SDSU. He was the linebacker coach over there. little tidbit about that team. The defense was ranked 20th in the nation, 4th in uh, pass, pass efficiency, 14th in run defense, 16th in points per game allowed, 17th in total defense. Uh, after that, in starting in 2011, he goes to the NFL coaching the Cleveland Browns. 
couple of cool little tidbits from his time from 2011 to 2017. In 2011, kicker Phil Dawson and returner Josh Cribbs were both selected to the Pro Bowl. Dawson made 93.5% of his uh, field goal kicks, 29 of 31. 2013, kicker Billy Cundiff set a franchise record with 62 touchbacks on kickoffs. 2014, uh, the Browns were second in the NFL in opposing field position on kickoffs, including 16 stops inside the 20-yard line. In 2015, kicker Travis Kuhn set an NFL record with 18 consecutive field goals to start his career, and punter Travis Benjamin finished third in the league with a punt return average of 11.6. Finally, in 2016, Britton Colquitt set a team net punting average uh, with 40.3. So that's about it. And then after that, he goes to Vanderbilt for a year, gets to be buddy-buddy with uh, Matt LaFleur, which I made that up, but I'm just you know i mean come on it happened all right and now he's here and he's not ron zook so we're happy beyond that um a couple more coaching moves were made jason simmons was promoted from secondary coach to defensive backs coach which apparently is a promotion i don't really know uh linguistically that doesn't seem like an upward thing i feel like they're nearly identical if anything defensive backs is a little bit more specific and more specific seems like a demotion rather than a promotion, like running back coach getting promoted to something broader like run game coordinator. But, you know, whatever. You can do whatever you want. You, you give the guy more money, you change his title. It's called a promotion, I guess. Uh, they also promoted Ryan Downard to uh, defensive quality control. Now, I tend to think that this means that these guys are really good coaches. Now, that seems like an obvious statement, but it certainly doesn't have to be if you look at things like Mike McCarthy used to do. The reason I say that is this isn't a complete overhaul of everything. If, if you look at the offensive coaches right now, Nathaniel Hackett, Luke Getze, uh, Justin Outen, Adam Stenovich, Alvis Witted, all different. The only guy that stayed, Ben Sermons. If you look at the production we got out of the running backs, the fact that we got... Some late round guys that ended up being studs. I mean that that's just what you want out of a coach, right? Isn't that the job of the coach? All right, the GM does his best to get guys that are talented, but from there it's all up to the coach to make these guys better. Take what they are and make them better. So many times, and I've said this a thousand times, guys get drafted and what they are is just what they are, and it's what they'll always be until we decide we don't want them anymore, usually after their contracts expire. That's all we've been getting for three years. We draft guys, they're not very good, they never get any better, and then they go bye-bye and we say good good riddance. Except for the part where we don't have anyone to back them up because the guys that were good back when we used to draft and develop, they're 900 years old and they've been gone for a long time. Ben Sermons did a phenomenal job, and that's why he's staying. Defense, also a relatively big overhaul. However, Jerry Montgomery, a guy that's been around for a while before Mike Pettin, it's not a Mike Pettin guy, this is, this is somebody that Mike McCarthy brought on. But again, look at that defense and tell me why in the world you would ever get rid of Jerry Montgomery. So this isn't just like a lot of people are saying, we just, we just want to purge everybody Mike McCarthy had. We just want to, not really, man. We just want guys that are doing their job. Ron Zook isn't gone because he's a McCarthy guy. Ron Zook's gone because special teams is a joke. Joe Witt didn't get fired because he's an old McCarthy guy. He got fired because our cornerbacks are kind of a joke. Because our secondary is just terrible. And always has. Well, not always, but for the last several years. That, that's why he's gone. That's why he's gone and Jerry Montgomery's staying. And, and again, the reason I bring this up, that's why he's gone and Jason Sermon's got promoted and Ryan Downard got promoted. I don't know. I can't look at these guys because all I can do is look at our corners and our safeties and say, well, they're not good. But apparently we purged the guys that weren't getting it done. We promoted the guys we believe can get it done. And from what I can see, the guys that are getting it done are staying on the staff. So I have every reason to have full confidence in Jason Simmons and Ryan Downard. And beyond that, I have every reason to have Confidence in Nathaniel Hackett, Luke Getze, Justin Outen, Adam Stenovich, Alvin Witted, or Alvis Witted, uh, Kirk Olvadati, Mike Smith. I have every reason to be invested in these guys because I don't think it's a matter of, you know, well, it's just hard to find good coaches. I think it's a matter of complacency that took place in, in Green Bay. 
Mike McCarthy had his guys, and his guys did the best they could, which whatever that meant, they just they had like a system, and it was just this. This is what we do, and they wake up the next day, and it's not about how do we innovate and change. It's about well, let's let's go back to what we do, and they're sitting here trying to run the 2010 Green Bay Packers, going, "What's going on, man? This this thing won't go." Yeah, man, you you ran that thing into the ground. You need a new car, change it up. So I yeah. I have every reason to be, I think we have every reason to be. That's not to say we know anything, but I think that we have a finely tuned machine. We have a really good car. It just wasn't taken care of. And we've got some younger, innovative minds. The guys that were already getting the job done are staying. The guys that weren't are gone. And now we have a bunch of Jerry Montgomery's and Ben Sermon's everywhere looking to get the job done. And Matt LaFleur and Mike Pettin made sure to find those guys. Mike Pettin went out to find the Jerry Montgomery's. He found out that we had two on the staff, Jason Simmons and Ryan Downard, and he promoted them. He fired everybody else, brought in Mike Smith and Kirk Olvidati. Matt LaFleur had to go out and find a bunch of Ben Sermons. Well, he found them. So yeah, I'm excited. Because I do think we have a very good team. We don't have the best roster in the NFL, but we have a very, 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 very good one. A good enough roster to get into the playoffs this year without a single addition, if we can just get everybody playing optimally, if we can get this offensive line playing as well as they possibly can, if we get Aaron Rodgers back to old Aaron Rodgers, if we can get, you know, um, the same production out of Devontae Adams, if we can get the same production out of our running backs, if we can get Jimmy Graham playing like, you know, 2017 Jimmy Graham, if we can get Mercedes Lewis playing like 2017 Mercedes Lewis, it's not going to take all that much. Just get the most out of these guys, and we're already in playoff contention. Actually get a little extra production, get a little more out of these guys than we're used to. Actually hit on a couple draft picks, give me one good free agent acquisition, a solid player, like a a really good safety perhaps. I have every reason to believe that this could be the year we make the push, that it's not a two-year rebuild. We're ready this year, but we'll see. Anyways, let's get talking about uh, these here Philadelphia Eagles, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So right out of the gate, just a little overview. Um, We're going to go through it the same way we have been over these last several. But um, we're kind of at the tail end here, and, and we're starting to see the fruits or the rotten fruits of what happens when you go all in. Now, this has been a common strategy for a lot of teams where you've got your young quarterback, or it it doesn't necessarily have to be that, but that's typically the strategy. But the point is, you go out in free agency, you stock up, you spend a ton of money because you just happen to have a bunch, you stock up and you make a serious push. Now, the problem with that is inevitably you're going to run out of money unless you start purging as you're going along, meaning you bring on seven or eight studs. The next year, you better you know cut that down to half or so because at some point you run into a wall with the salary cap. We already saw it with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I talked about that. They're in a bind, and they never quite made it. They were close. The Eagles did make it. So it's a really dangerous game because you could get yourself into a very serious problem with the salary cap unless you have a long-term strategy. It'll be interesting to see how teams like the Eagles and the Jaguars handle this because those teams that did that are now having to you know, face their ultimate destiny. 
again, the Eagles got their Super Bowl, so whatever happens, it, it essentially was worth it because that was the goal. We need to go get that Super Bowl. They got it. But, uh, you know, how long is it going to take to unravel this? Can they be back on their feet this year and ready to go and, and salary caps in order? Or is it going to take a little while? Because they're, they're in trouble for a couple of years, especially with the guys with the young quarterbacks. Because eventually you got to pay that quarterback too. So you better not only have your salary cap cleaned up, but you better have a surplus by the time your quarterback comes due. If you look at the Philadelphia Eagles, first of all, right now, they are negative 18.4 according to over the cap. So they're $18.4 million over their salary cap. They have to get that down. Now, it's almost a guarantee Nick Foles is out the door. Um, There's going to be $2.8 million of dead money, but it frees up $18.8 million. Now, that puts them basically at zero. So they've got more stuff to do. We'll get into that. But if you go beyond that, in 2020, guess who's due a $30 million contract? Carson Wentz. Now, at that time, as of right now in 2020, they're sitting on about almost $40 million. And they can, you know, backload the contract a little bit, maybe give them like 23, 25 this year. But they're still kind of in a tough spot. Beyond that, they've got some other really big free agents. Well, it's, it's twofold because in 2019, this year, they have to re-sign some. The guys that they re-sign that aren't one-year contracts are going to bleed into 2020, which takes that $40 million down already on top of Carson Wentz. And then on top of that, you got a guy like Jason Peters, who's an incredible left tackle. you got Chris Long, who's a good defensive end. You've got uh, Wisniewski, your guard. you got Nelson Aguilar. You got, uh, you know, DeAndre Hall at safety, Craven, LeBron, Josh Hawkins, Wendell Smallwood, Braxton. I mean, there's a lot of guys. Again, on top of those 2019 guys that you have to sign to multi-year contracts, it's going to be tough, man. So this is the danger. This is the danger of saying, oh, we've got a bunch of money. Let's just go get a ton of guys. If you can do it on short-term contracts so that come 2019, right? They did this, what, in 2017. If you could say by 2019 these guys are gone, and, you know, in that time, we really have to hit on the draft and start developing people and start drafting so that we're replacing these guys. They went out and got a ton of defensive tackles. Have you been drafting defensive tackles in preparation for the day when you just have to say bye-bye to all these guys? I suppose a little bit. They got Derek Barnett in the first round in 2017. They got uh, Josh Sweat in 2018, defensive end. They're probably going to have to hit it a little bit more in this draft class just to make sure that they can move on from some of these guys. But anyways, let's start looking at uh, their situation for this year. I just wanted to point that out, that that's kind of the situation they're in. That's their dilemma right now. They, they really built up. Now they got to find a way to disassemble so that they're under the cap, but also aren't just completely, you know, gutting their team. They want to try to keep as much of this afloat as they possibly can. But again, you also got to think long term because you don't ever want there to be a complete collapse point. So you might have to gut a little bit more than you want to so that you can do another half measure in 2020 and still be afloat. Otherwise, you cut one guy like Foles and you're like, all right, well, I guess that's good enough. And then 2020, it's like, we got to gut half this team. And then you're doomed. You want this to be a gradual work down would be my thought process on that. But anyways, free agents this year, and they've got quite a few to think about. And again, the reason this is more impactful than any other team is because other teams you can look at and say, well, we can re-sign these guys. We don't have any money. And in in every single person we sign, because again, we know Foles is gone, and maybe if they trade him, they get a little bit of, uh, they can recoup some of that, but they're not going to recoup any money. They'll just get a draft pick so that they can try to replace some of these players. But for everybody we say, okay, we got to re-sign this guy, you got to come up with that money somewhere. You have to get rid of somebody on the other side. So, uh, looking at uh, quarterbacks, we got nothing yet, but again, Nick Foles in 2020, big, big money. There's some talk about keep Nick Foles, trade Carson Wentz. It's not going to happen, man. They, listen, Nick Foles is overblown as far as how good he is. He played two unbelievable games when they won the Super Bowl, just played out of his mind. Other than that, he's he's always been, I mean, we know what Nick Foles is. We've seen him. He's shown flashes of being really good, but he's, he's not Carson Wentz. He's also a lot older. Carson Wentz is like 26. Carson Wentz is the future for that team. Just done deal. The injury history is, is the biggest problem with Carson Wentz. It's the biggest fear. But you, you do not trade Carson Wentz in, in favor of keeping Nick Foles. That just does not happen. But anyways, uh, at running back, Darren Sproles and Jay Ajayi are both free agents. Uh, outside of that, they have Corey Clement, uh, Josh Adams, Wendell Smallwood, Boston Scott, and Donnell Pumphrey. 
Uh, Pumphrey was a recent signing, obviously didn't make too much of an impact. You know, it, it's a situation where you look at it and you want to say, just let him walk. But you look at the way the Eagles run their offense, it's somewhat similar to how the Patriots do, right? They've got a bunch of kind of bunch of kind of mediocre-ish guys. Maybe that's a little harsh for Jay Ajayi, I don't know. But, you know, all these guys, it's kind of just, they have a role. And with this little trio here, and, you know, mixing a little small wood here and there or whatever, we kind of make it work, and we have a decent patchwork. Hey, we're back at it. Too much dance party in one day. I'm, I don't know if I can handle all that. We kind of make it work. If you get rid of Darren Sproles and Jay Ajayi and just try to run with Corey Clement, it's going to hurt a little bit. Corey Clement is a decent receiving back, but you have to have a running back running back. I suppose maybe you could do Josh Adams. Um, and, and Darren Sproles might be gone anyways. I don't really remember the story on him. If he said he was gone or if he wanted to give it another shot, I'm not really entirely sure. But I guess maybe you try to run with uh, Josh Adams and Corey Clement. Hope that Donnell Pumphrey can kind of step up into a role. You've got uh, Wendell Smallwood, who's not very good at anything, but, you know, whatever. Clement's your third down guy. He's a good receiving back, a decent pass blocker. Josh Adams is a decent runner. And there you go. So, yeah, my I guess my assumption at this point, based on our salary cap, is that Jay Ajayi and, um, you know, maybe I will do it a little different this week. Maybe I will just go position by position and kind of take it all, rather than going category by category. Let's do that. So we kind of did quarterback already. We probably will see Carson Wentz unless it's the end of the year and he's hurt already. Carson Wentz is a uh, pretty solid football player, graded out as the 14th best in the NFL. 2017, he was an even better quarterback, um, substantially better, actually. I mean, he's, he's a good football player. There's, there's no question about that. Uh, the running back situation for them, I think, could be a little bit more difficult. I suppose if we're going to do it this way, let me just quickly go through and look at some people just so we have an idea. Some people maybe we may have to get rid of just so that we can it, just so we can free up a little bit more money. Um, oh, man. Oof. They have not done a good job with their... You know, usually there's a ton of guys where you, you have options of getting rid of them, but most of these guys are sitting on a lot of dead money. I, I get the feeling they pushed a lot of their money back. Which, by the way, anybody that tells you the salary cap isn't real and, you know, you can just do whatever... Stop. Please stop saying that. This is very basic mathematics. All right? We're, we're talking about, you know, what, addition and subtraction. I mean, come on, guys. There, there's a salary cap. You cannot go over it. Why don't teams just sign everybody? I mean, it's just, come on, man. There are some pretty intelligent people who say that nonsense, and it draws, just absolutely drives me nuts. Well, you can do stuff with their, yeah, you can do stuff like push the money back, which hurts you in the future, right? I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, I can swipe my credit card all I want. And just, like, money's not real. I can swipe this card all day long, and, like, I can buy out the entire Best Buy store. I can buy all these TVs. Don't even have to, I don't have the money in the bank, but it doesn't matter, man. Money's not real, bro. <laughs> it's like a cosmic mystery, bro. It's like it doesn't even exist, man. Yeah, until your bill shows up in the mail, and then interest on top of that, and then you're underwater. This st <sighs> Just stop saying that, please. Salary cap doesn't mean anything. You can just you can just do stuff with the salary cap and yeah do stuff. But it, come on, man. Ignant. You sound ignorant when you say that. If that was true, we could have just offered Khalil Mack forty million dollars. Why didn't we do that? Seri I mean, it's a serious question. Why didn't we offer Khalil Mack forty million dollars? Why don't we just offer every free agent? It doesn't matter who it is. Let's go to Earl Thomas and be like, dude, how do you want a hundred? Uh, you want a hundred million bucks? I'll give you a hundred million. Boom. One year, hundred million guaranteed, bud. Because the salary cap exists, that's why you can't do that. There's a salary cap, and it is real. It's a real hard limit. You cannot go over it. There's some maneuvering, some creative maneuvering you can do, but it's all based on real numbers. And if you push the money out, that can work to some degree if you're planning on some guys maybe leaving so that you'll have more money. But there's also situations where you want to front load, like we got Carson Wentz coming up next year. We don't, we need as much money as we can possibly get. Sorry, that just absolutely makes me nuts. But anyways, bottom line is we're in a really, really tough spot. The only person, or I should say the first person that comes up is Jason Peters. He's a 37-year-old tackle. 
the problem is he's Jason Peters. He's a good tackle. He didn't have the best year of his life. Um, you know, there's there's a little bit of a decline going on maybe. But, dude, you're not going to cut Jason Peters in the last year of his contract just to save a little bit of money, what, so you can sign Jay Ajayi? Never. Maybe you're not going to re-sign him next year because he's going to be 38 and you guys leave on good terms, but that's silly. So, no, we're not cutting Jason Peters. We're not trading Jason Peters. I mean, maybe we could try to trade him and then draft another left tackle. I don't know. I mean, we got uh, Halavuda Vaitai. Nope, let me try that again. Halapulivati. Halapulivati Vaitai. Boom. Probably sounds something like that anyways. But he's not good. I just wanted to say it. Also, Jordan Mailata. Also just wanted to say that. There's no reason to say that. I just felt like it. But we don't have anybody on the roster right now. And it's it's kind of similar to what we've got going on with Brian Balaga, except, you know, like, what, five, six, seven years difference? But it's one of those things where it's like, I'd like to have somebody on the roster to replace him so that we could have that money. But no, we're not going to get rid of him in the last year of our, our of his contract to try to save a little bit of money because we don't have anybody else. And there's no reason to just cut a guy in the last year of his career because that's just silly and mean spirited. So that's probably not going to work. What else we got? Here we go. Nelson Aguilar. It's actually funny because when I did my um, mock draft, I had the Eagles taking a wide receiver. I took a slot wide receiver because I said Golden Tate, it doesn't make sense to keep paying this guy. Don't give him another contract. You don't have any money. Just go ahead and get a new slot receiver and, and move on. And somebody jumped up in the comment section, we don't need a slot receiver. We got Nelson Aguilar. Well, first of all, Aguilar isn't very good. Second of all, he is owed $9.3 million with zero dead cap space. He is, he's, he's gone yesterday. So that should be $10 million bucks for us right there. Um, some other guys to look at. Michael Bennett. Somewhat of a tough decision, but we have so many people. Brandon Graham, very, very good uh, guy off the edge. Chris Long, talented guy. Derek Barnett, we just drafted. Pretty solid guy. Josh Sweat, we just drafted. He was decent. Uh, Deshaun Hall, not too bad. There's a lot of depth here. We don't need Michael Bennett in addition to all these people. And we got to start pur- start purging. Michael Bennett is one of the guys that we paid big money for. He played a role. He came over, all this stuff. Plus, he's just kind of a... I mean, I don't want him on my team at all. So you're, you're, you're saving yourself some money and some headaches by getting rid of Michael Bennett. But uh, that'll save you $7 bucks. Jason Kelsey, you could get rid of, but no chance in the world are we getting rid of our center, Jason Kelsey. Chris Long is another guy. we got to kind of kind of be careful a little bit. We don't want to purge too many people, but if we decided to get rid of another guy, Chris Long would save us another $5.3 million. So these are kind of the guys that I'm looking at. Uh, Nelson Aguilar is 100% gone. I'm not paying $9.387 million for a below average. I, I guess we'll call him average because I'm being unfair, but he's not that good, man. No. No, I mean, it, listen, I'll pay Golden Tate. I'll take that money and just give it to Golden Tate if I need to. I'm not paying that to, to Nelson Aguilar. Are you out of your mind? But also we got uh, Michael Bennett and Chris Long, maybe one or the other. I don't know. But um, I don't think it'd be the worst thing to dump those guys and then look to the draft, which is stacked with defensive tackle and uh, you know defensive end talent that you can pick up. All right, go get the other sweat. Go get, you got Josh and Montez. But that's really it. So, again, we're kind of in a tough spot. Once we get rid of Foles, we're at about zero. If we get rid of all three of those guys, you know, we're sitting at about $23 million. You figure once we sign our draft picks, we got one first, two second-round picks, a fourth, fifth, and a sixth. I don't know what that is, $7 million bucks. We're You know, we're, we're somewhere between 15 and $20 million. That's if we get rid of two talented defensive ends and our backup quarterback and Nelson Aguilar. So there's that. So that's kind of our situation as far as, you know, if we even do that. And now as we go through this, again, we're sitting at running back and we're saying, we only have a little bit of money. Do we want to sign Jay Ajayi? For me, I'm probably saying no. I know he had a pretty good year a couple years ago. Hasn't been all that great the last couple years. Uh, Moving over to wide receiver, we're in a little bit of a tough spot because we're probably moving on from Nelson Aguilar. Now We've got a lot of, of bodies here. But of these bodies, Golden Tate, Mike Wallace, Jordan Matthews are all free agents. So I think Mike Wallace is probably an easy pass. Let him go. But Golden Tate and Jordan Matthews are our number two and three behind Alshon Jeffrey. So we got Alshon. That's cool. If we don't, if we 
purge Nelson Aguilar for $9 million, and we're sitting at, let's just say we have, let's just call it $20 million, and we're not signing any running backs. So all we've got, we're kind of thinned out at running back. Now we don't have Nelson Aguilar. Are we going to sign Golden Tate again? He got a $7 million contract this last year. If we sign him again, I can't imagine it's going to be less than $7 million because he proved himself. He was a very good asset. And $7 million isn't all that much. But again, if, if we have $20 million, it brings us to 13 That's a big chunk of our very li- limited amount of money for one wide receiver that's just, you know, kind of good. And it's similar to a lot of the situations we've been in. We can't bring him back, but we can't not bring him back. And Golden Tate was, was the clear number two on this team ahead of Jordan Matthews. I mean, Nelson, Nelson Aguilar is actually, based on the snap counts, he was the number one wide receiver on the team. But as far as his talent, I mean, it's just, this is tough, man. And this is, again, this is the problem. This is why you got guys like Ted Thompson that don't just go crazy in free agency. This is why, because you hit this wall and then you hit a, a just complete collapse. And it's why teams disappear. And it's why the Packers never really disappeared until now, which wasn't because of salary cap issues. It was just, you know, not very good coaching, not very good drafting. So there was no draft and no develop in a draft and develop philosophy team. But we were able to keep a team afloat because we went with draft and develop, and we didn't have to hammer free agency very much, and we did a good enough job with draft and develop. This is the other side of it. This is what all the fans want, but this is the problem. We don't have any money. We've got a bunch of other guys sitting here. Uh, I don't know, you know, Braxton Miller is a guy that we got very recently. I don't know what he's going to be able to do. Presumably, we have to sign somebody, though. Golden Tate is 31 years old. Jordan Matthews is only 27. I feel like we have to retain Jordan Matthews. I mean, he's, he's coming off his rookie contract. Are, are we really going to dump him off his rookie contract? But how much are we going to pay him? He hasn't been all that good for our team. So, I, you know, again, tough spot. And even if they retained everybody, again, looking at our matchup, it, it's nothing here is all that impressive to me. I mean, it's not bad, but they don't have a great running back. They've got a pretty good quarterback and some decent wide receivers. Nobody's super elite. You know, Golden Tate is okay. Alshon Jeffries, he's pretty good. But this is doable. We can manage this. But then looking at 2019 and saying they have to get rid of some of these guys. They're not going to have a ton of really talented running backs anymore. Not that they ever really did. They're going to be short quite a few wide receivers. And they're probably going to have to rely on all these guys, you know, Shelton Gibson Mac Hollins, Carlton Agudosi, Mark and Michael, Doran Miller, Braxton Miller, Johnny Holton. Some of these guys got to step up at some point because why are you just sitting there? Somebody's got to step up and do something because we can't afford to keep playing these guys while you guys sit around here and just watch, paying you to have sideline passes to our games. That's why you have these guys to hopefully step up so we don't have to keep paying guys like Golden Tate or you know overpay guys like Jordan Matthews, who I would like to just let go because he's not really worth that first big contract. Which, what, what is he going to want, Seven, eight, nine million dollars $9 He's a free agent, man. If you don't lock him up, somebody's probably going to give him that. So I, I don't know, man. But again, I, I, it's one of those situations where I don't even care what they do. If they get rid of him, awesome. It's easier for us to beat him because they don't have any wide receivers. If they do pay him, even better, now you have no money. You're not getting any free agents, which is already kind of a done deal. You're, they're probably not going to be getting much, if anything, in free agency. But then that also means it's more likely they're getting rid of other talent, like on the defensive side of the ball, which makes it easier for us on offense. So do whatever you want. I'm happy either way. Uh, looking at their tight ends, they're they're pretty set. Zach Ertz is still signed for a good long time. Dallas Goddard was really talented. Uh, Richard Rodgers is a free agent. No reason to really worry about re-signing him. So um, it's going to be Zach Ertz, and it's going to be Dallas Goddard. So that's going to be problematic. I mean, it's two talented tight ends. The Packers are going to have to find a way to match up. And that's the one thing that will alleviate a little bit as far as his wide receiver position for them because these are kind of two wide receivers. They can put two tight ends split out with, uh, you know, um, Alshon Jeffrey, and you basically have three wide receivers out there. So it alleviates a little bit of that stress and that pressure. Offensive line, Jason Kelsey, consistently the top center in the NFL. Very, very, very talented. Um, again, they could get rid of him. Um, maybe that, that in 2020, he presents a problem. Uh, this year, they could get rid of him because they have no dead money, but you're not getting rid of him because he's just he's a cornerstone of this offense. You have to keep him. Um, at guard, Chance Warmack is a free agent. Probably just let him walk. He hasn't been any good since 2015. He's just, it's not happening. But, um, you know, as far as their talent goes, Brandon Brooks, he's okay. 
decent right guard, uh, left guard Isaac Sumalo. We'll go with that. Eh, it's kind of like Justin McCray territory. And then we get out to tackles. Again, Lane Johnson. Mm, well, I mean, Jason Peters. So Lane Johnson and Jason Peters, both pretty solid. Jason Peters, maybe not quite as good as he once was, but still a very talented uh, left tackle. Lane Johnson, though, on the right side is is very, very talented. Not quite top 10, but, I mean, he's he's every bit as good as uh, as Brian Balaga is. The one difference, though, is he's maybe not quite as good of a pass blocker, but he's as good as a run blocker as he is as a pass blocker. Very, very, um, very, very talented run blocker. So the offensive line is pretty solid. They've got a decent left tackle, a good right tackle, an elite center, a decent right guard. Left guard, maybe they could use a little help, but, you know, whatever. They also have Halapulati Vaitai. Nope. Halapulavati Vaitai. There we go. He's not good. He's not going to play. But any opportunity I have to say his name, it's a good day. Halapulavati Vaitai. Burned him. So overall, looking at the offense, it's, I mean, it's, it's a beatable offense. There, there really isn't anything elite with the exception of their center. Alshon Jeffrey is decent. Uh, Nelson Aguilar is not good if he even sticks around. Golden Tate uh, is mediocre if he even sticks around. Got a decent quarterback, a few good, you know, basically Lane Johnson and Travis Kelsey are the cornerstone of the offense. Jason Peters kind of getting up in age. The guards are, you know, mediocre-ish. There's really no point at which I'm really concerned outside of the tight ends. I think we have the corner talent if we can, you know, again, get guys to kind of step up a little bit. We got the corner talent to be able to handle whatever they have, which I'm assuming is going to look something like Alshon Jeffrey and not much else. And we're probably going to have a guy like Josh Jackson on the tight ends. Josh Jones and Josh Jackson kind of make sense in this game to kind of as a matchup against these tight ends but that's going to depend on their ability to step up because as it stands right now, I don't trust either of them to take on either of these tight ends. But a beatable offensive line, beatable wide receivers, not very much talent at running back, decent quarterback. I mean, there's no reason, if if our offense is able to put up points against their defense, and we'll get to that next, there's no reason in my mind that we can't beat this team because our defense should be able to handle this offense. If this offense is running all over our defense, we don't have much of a chance. Because this this offense compared to the rest of the NFL is, I would have to assume, pretty mediocre in terms of just talent. But anyways, let's take a look at uh, the defense. So I want to start with the interior because that's really where their strength come from. They That's where they invested a lot of their money. That's where they got a lot of really good return. And that's kind of what's helped this team propel itself. Right out of the gate, up front, in the center, Fletcher Cox, Trayvon Hester. Very, very, very talented guys. Uh, both of them are going to be sticking around for a while. 2019 is the first time we have an issue with Hester, and uh, they'll probably be keeping him around. The one guy that uh, probably is going to go bye-bye is Haloti Nada. I don't know that. They could try to keep him around. He did play fairly well, and actually, they're, they're really, really, relatively is not a word. Relatively is, so let's run with that, shall we? Goodness gracious, they're relatively thin at the defensive tackle position. They are stacked beyond stacked at uh, on the edge. And they do have guys like Michael Bennett that can play outside and inside, which helps with the defensive tackle position. But true defensive tackles, Fletcher Cox, Trayvon Hester, Haloti Nada, and then they've got Tim Jernigan, who is not good, and Bruce Hector, that is not all that great. So if they get rid of Haloti Nada, they really just have two elite guys. Not a whole lot to rotate, though. And Hester only played a total of 261 snaps. Haloti Nada played 421, with Fletcher Cox taking 926, basically playing just about every snap. So presumably they are bringing a lot of these guys inside, the edge guys, that is. The problem, however, is if Michael Bennett leaves, you're not only losing an edge rusher, you're losing a defensive tackle. So maybe you don't get rid of them. But again, if you don't get rid of them, now instead of having that... 20 million dollars in free cap space you're looking at what you know 14 million tops so I don't don't know and again it's a stacked defensive tackle class so it's possible we move on from Michael Bennett and we just load up we've got the 25th pick we could absolutely get a defensive tackle now again the biggest problem with that like every team has is you've got a bunch of needs is defensive tackle your biggest need Eagles fans are going to lose it because the defensive line is their biggest strength on the entire team presume or you know probably not sure what perception is over there in Philly, but that seems to be my interpretation. But the long-term 
goal would be let's draft defensive tackle because it's, uh, you know, very plentiful in the draft. We can get a stud that's probably falling way too far because, you know, again, it creates that kind of bottleneck that I talked about where you have a ton of defensive tackles, but a lot of teams that don't need it. So they're just going to continue to fall and then they start to stack up. And then when a team does take a defensive tackle, there's still four other that four others that should have been gone by the time you get to 25. So it's more than likely by the time you get to the end of the draft, the most talented players still on the board are going to be defensive tackles. So we'll see what they decide to do. They have other needs. They could get a wide receiver. They could use you know, a lot of stuff. I don't know if there's going to be a running back worth the, the pick there, but um, I don't know. It's, it's a tough spot to be in. Talking about edge rushers now, um, we talked about Michael Bennett. Pretty good case that they're going to need to keep him if they're not drafting somebody. And the problem is the draft is after free agency, so you got to make up a decision because if you wait until the draft, Michael Bennett's already going to be on another team. So that's another complication. You can't just say, well, we'll just draft one. Well, you don't know that. There might not be somebody sitting there that you like. Especially somebody as versatile as Michael Bennett, that can you know if you, again if you lose Michael Bennett, you're losing a, a you're losing much needed depth on the defensive line. You're also losing an edge rusher off the edge. Brandon Graham is their top guy, very very talented. But again, Michael Bennett and Chris Long, you save a lot of money by getting rid of them. If you keep them, we don't have a lot of money. If you get rid of them, we don't have a lot of players. We have Derek Barnett, who is decent. He's a first round draft pick. He hasn't quite gotten up into that good category. He's been average for two years now. Much better run defender than a pass rusher, which is kind of a problem because Michael Bennett and Chris Long are pretty good pass rushers. After that, you know, Josh Sweat, not very good at much of anything. DJ Alexander, I I don't know. He played one snap. uh, Joe Ostman hasn't done anything. Deshaun Hall, kind of just a mediocre meh guy. So again, tough situation. As far as the Packers are concerned, you know, and, and you, you know, you could be looking at restructuring type stuff. Some of these guys, and this is where the salary cap is real, but we can tweak it. The problem is, if you restructure Michael Bennett and say, okay, let's pay you less this year and more next year, what's the problem with paying him more next year? Right? They've, they've got almost $40 million, but again, you know, maybe let's just say 25 at least is going to Carson Wentz. Then Michael Bennett goes from you know, rather than getting six million this year, he's going to get paid four million, and then next year he's getting paid eleven. You know, you extend some of these guys. I mean, you, you got to get kind of creative, but at some point it just kind of builds up as it goes on. But as time goes on, again, you start losing guys like Jason Peters, whatever. That shaves ten million off here and there. So maybe they'll do something like that. So as I'm looking at it, I just have to assume Chris Long and Michael Bennett, who are under contract, are going to stay on the team, meaning. You got Fletcher Cox, you got Brandon Graham, very, very talented guys. Trayvon Hester, um, I think he just kind of came out of nowhere. He was kind of a nobody in his rookie year. Second year, he really blew up. Only had 261 snaps, but again, it's one of those things where we don't expect anything of him. We're using Fletcher Cox and Haloti Nada. Those are our guys, but this guy Hester is a freak, man. Every time we put him in, he's just killing everybody. Not quite the pass rusher that Fletcher Cox is, but he's not bad, and he's a really good run defender. So... Those two guys on the inside, Brandon Graham, Michael Bennett, Chris Long. I mean, it's, it's a talented front, man. That's going to be tough for the Packers. Um, the good news, however, is that primarily what that means is Aaron Rodgers needs to get the ball out quickly, and we might have a hard time running it. But if we have an efficient pass game, we can still carve this team up. So let's move on to linebacker now. Because now when we talk about linebacker, we're talking about you know additional help with the run game. Because you know guys up front have different strengths and different weaknesses. If you're a good pass rusher, that doesn't mean you can do anything against the run necessarily. And if you start bringing more pressure, then, it, you know, that's when you can kind of get carved up with screens. You know, the run game can actually hurt you if you're trying to penetrate. Suddenly there's there's gaps everywhere, and then it's down to your linebackers. How good are they to be able to pick up the mess that you just left behind? Well, as far as free agents, uh, Jordan Hicks, DJ Alexander, Paul, War- Paul Warlow, and Leroy Reynolds... Warlow is how you say his name, I think. So the situation here essentially is they have one good linebacker. His name is Jordan Hicks, and he's a free agent, or soon to be a free agent, I should say. None of these guys are currently free agents. So this is a situation where Jordan Hicks is coming off his rookie contract. You've been able to develop this guy. He's been a relatively good contributor for you since day one. You've got to resign him. You just have to. And again, we're putting even more strain on the salary cap. Now, maybe it's only going to be 4 or $5 million, but again, if we're dealing with 20 right out of the gate, and that's assuming we're cutting guys. If we're not, we're dealing with about, what, 10 
So, you know, restructure, push more money out, extend guys for a guy like Jordan Hicks. But then you've got kind of just a pile of meh. Nigel Bradham is okay against the run. Pretty terrible in coverage. Mediocre pass rusher, I guess. And uh, Camu Greer-Hill. So th- those are the three guys. Nigel Bradham, Jordan Hicks, and Camu Greer-Hill are the three guys. Jordan Hicks is going to have to be re-signed. They'll re-sign him. And essentially what we're going to be dealing with is Jordan Hicks, who's a decent inside linebacker, and a couple of just mediocre kind of guys. The good thing with a creative type of uh, offensive coordinator, creative offensive scheme, is if we're able to utilize tight ends, if we're able to utilize running backs, if we're able to kind of get linebackers just guessing a little bit and moving and and trying to figure out what to do, get them to hesitate, if they have to respect our tight ends and and their coverage needs to be on point, that's going to help us be able to run the ball. If we're effective at running the ball, we should be able to take care of them over the middle of the field because these are limited linebackers. So that is my assumption. They'll keep Jordan Hicks as far as some of the other guys like uh, Leroy Reynolds, DJ Alexander, and Paul Warlow. I mean, do what you want, but I'm I'm fine letting them all go. And then finally, looking at their uh, corner situation, uh, the top guys in terms of snap counts are Avante Maddox, Razul Douglas, and Ronald Darby, uh, followed by Craven LeBlanc and Jalen Mills. In terms of actual talent, it's Razul Douglas, Craven LeBlanc, and Ronald Darby. Ronald Darby, however, is uh, he's due a contract. The unfortunate thing for the Eagles is that Ronald Darby is coming off his rookie contract. The man is only 25 years old. A talented 25-year-old cornerback is worth a good chunk of change. You have to resign this guy. You just have to. If you start letting guys like this walk, that's when you know guys are that's when you know teams are in trouble. This is exactly what you're trying to do. You draft guys, you develop them, and then you give them that contract. That's what everybody wants to do. So they have to resign them. I don't know how they're going to. It'll be very, very interesting. This will be, it's part of the reason why I want to do these follow-ups because it'll be very interesting to take what I've said now and then look at what exactly they did and what the implications of that are going to be because they have to resign guys like this. It'll be interesting to see what kind of compensation they get for Foles, uh, who gets re-signed. There's still going to be time to trade people. You know, you could trade people during the draft if you want to. But uh, there's some, some more money going out. But as far as these top three guys here, Razul Douglas, Craven LeBlanc, and presumably Ronald Darby, they're okay. The biggest problem that I have with things like this is you've got three guys that are decent, and you can say, well, Devontae Adams is going to carve up Razul Douglas. Okay, that's cool. And he'll take out, you know, regardless of what side of the field he's on, he's going to be fine. But this is where if you don't have a number two, three, four, whatever that can do anything, Craven LeBlanc and Ronald Darby can handle subpar wide receivers so so we're back to that situation where we've got one wide receiver and they can take away one wide receiver teams can do that especially when they have a talented front so they can take away the run game they're getting a lot of pressure on their quarterbacks our number two our number three guys and our tight ends can't do anything And i'm talking about 2018 and why it needs to change and improve and why it's so important that we do have a number two whether we develop a guy or we draft a guy we got to have one or at the very least a talented tight end that's going to stress defenses because otherwise Again, Ronald Darby and Craven LeBlanc are going to have a, a, just an absolute feast. They're, they're just going to destroy our wide receivers. And it gets back to Aaron Rodgers has no time to throw, and he's just staring down Devontae Adams, and he's double teamed all day, and our offense can't go anywhere. We need to be multiple, man. We need to be able to adjust and adapt to just about everything. We need to have guys that have strengths that you just that, that are matchup problems. We've got talented athletic wide receivers. We need a guy like Hackett and a guy like LaFleur to be able to figure out how to maximize those talent. we we got to use creativity. It's not. It can't just be man up and beat your guy like McCarthy used to do because I'm telling you, that ain't going to work against the Eagles. They, that's, that's what they live for. Please go toe-to-toe with us. We need to be intelligent. We need to be using motion. We need to get these linebackers kind of guessing and guessing wrong. We want these defensive tackles and edge rushers to overextend themselves and we'll destroy them with, uh, you know, delayed runs and screens. Stuff that we've been practicing over and over and over again that we execute to perfection. We want the defense just tripping all over itself and everything you do is just shooting yourself in the foot. We want to rely more on the creative mind of our head coach and of our offensive coordinator to create opportunities for our offense rather than saying, you know, rather than like me playing Madden where it's like, I don't know, this play's cool, just go beat somebody. And I stand there like, well, why isn't anybody open? I don't know, X. Just hit a button. We'll see what happens. 
That was the 2018 Packers. No, you got to be more strategic than that, and I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. Finally, looking at the safeties, um, they've got Corey Graham and Chris Maragos, two guys that are free agents. Corey Graham is the only one that really matters. Corey Graham's getting up in age, so on, on one hand, it's hard to justify keeping him, especially considering his lack of production. However, he was only signed for $1.69 million, so probably not going to get much more, if any more money than that, if they do decide to resign him. Although I don't think they necessarily even need to. They've got uh, Rodney McLeod here, who was on IR, that I think could easily step in. Uh, so they'll probably let Corey Graham go, let Rodney go up into that free safety spot. Malcolm Jenkins is the strong safety, and then they've essentially got two good safeties. So they've got, their secondary doesn't have a lot of depth, but they've got some talent. They've got three guys that are at least starter capable, right? Their third best corner was ranked 39th in the NFL. That's pretty good. They've got three guys that are basically low-end number ones, top-end number twos. And then they've got uh, two, you know, top 20, top 25, whatever, two, two starting caliber safeties. And again, if we don't have more talent than just Devontae Adams, we're not going to be able to do anything against this defense. It's just not going to happen. So the Eagles are in a tough spot. Their offense, I think, is maybe going to struggle a little bit. Um, they already are not the most talented offense. Decent offensive line, but they're kind of coming to the end of their road. Um, going to need to find a new replacement at left tackle. Their tackle is currently 37, which is crazy. But they've got a talented quarterback, and if you see what, uh, for example, Russell Wilson is doing with Seattle, no offensive line. They haven't had a running back for a very long time with the exception of this past year. You know, the wide receiver talent is is whatever, whatever, but, you know, a talented quarterback can make some stuff happen. I think Carson Wentz is talented enough to make, you know, a decent team go. The bigger issue for us, though, is going to be that this defense, despite maybe losing a couple guys, maybe they do get rid of Chris Long to try to save up a little bit of money. Plus, you can trade a guy like Chris Long or Michael Bennett. Probably not Michael Bennett as much. Maybe you just keep him because teams are going to, you know, red flag Michael Bennett, and that kind of hurts the value that you get in a trade. But Chris Long will probably recoup a little bit of value. So you can pick up some draft picks to try to patch up a few of these holes, start purging some guys like Chris Long, and see what can happen. But this will be a little bit more interesting to watch as far as free agency and the draft to see how they handle this. And then again, we'll we'll recap it again. So we'll recap after free agency, recap after the draft, and then we'll do a, a once-over for all our opponents prior to the season just to kind of see where we end up. And again, by the time by the time the season starts, everybody listening to this podcast is going to know our opponents inside and out. And that's kind of the goal. But anyways, I'm going to hop off. You folks enjoy your day. It's Friday, so I will talk to you tomorrow. Have yourselves a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.